welcome to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a stroke survivor and grateful recovering alcoholic. Today, I'll be talking about getting present, living in the present moment. And I wanted to start off with a story. Um, It's story time about uh, how when before I got sober, I was not living in the moment. And, And to just talk about how I was future tripping with fear because I wasn't staying in the moment. I wasn't taking care of the things that were right in front of me. Um, and, and yet future tripping with aspirations about how I'm going to be great. You know, I'm going to be number one at this and number one, but yet not putting in the work to get there. When I was drinking, one day I was one of many days I was laying in bed it was before noon and I just could not get out of bed and my mom came over I don't know why she came over but she came over and I was in bed and I just couldn't get up. I was miserable. I was just so hungover and sick. And um, I would keep running to the bathroom to throw up. And all along, I was thinking, poor me, I'm sick. Like, like I had the flu or something like that. I didn't even see that my illness is what I was I was doing to myself. And my mom came over and I remember her standing in my bedroom saying, Rachel, you've got to get your shit together. You've got to get out of bed. And my mom's not like that. (laughs) It's, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And and she was just like, this cannot go on. Um, And I remember distinctly my daughter standing in the doorway, and she was watching this. I was so not engaged in the present moment. I was so self-centered. I did not even consider what my daughter must have felt like. I'm sure that I wasn't you know, completely ignorant to the fact that this is not good for my daughter to see that. But I really did not process the severity of what I was doing to her as as a little as a little girl. I believe she was in eighth grade. I could be mistaken, but it was it might have been ninth grade, somewhere around that age. And I was like, Mom, I can't, I can't. And then I remember running to the bathroom to throw up. And so fast forward, I did my uh, step nine with my daughter, which is um, making amends, you know, for the role that I played, the hurt that I, that I put on her, the pain, um, And she shared with me that she had a teacher that, um, that she had shared with him that I was an alcoholic and he asked her, it must feel like you're taking care of her, like you're her mother. And she shared that with me and I'll never, I'll never let go of that that sadness that by remembering that it is just another reason for me to stay sober today. And this is just one example of a day in the life of alcoholic Rachel. There was so much more of my responsibilities that I was ignoring, not just my children's mental health by watching their mother 
just not get up to take them to school, you know, late to take them to school. Like, that was my fault that they missed the bus. It was my fault that they needed a note because they were showing up late. I'm the mother, you know. Of course, they're supposed to learn how to get up on time. But at the end of the day, it's my fault. I feel like it's my fault as a mother. And it took, once I got sober, a lot of patience and consistency to recover all that I had lost. I had, I was a couple months late on all of my bills, including my mortgage. So that's thousands of dollars um, behind. I was, all of my credit cards were maxed because when I didn't have the money, I would put the alcohol on my credit cards. And I, not only just the alcohol, but I didn't, I wasn't managing my money. And, you know, I didn't care. I didn't care about anything. Um, my relationships were broken. My, uh, I was either not showing up to work, calling in sick using excuses for not coming or not being trustworthy, you know. Um, And then my health, it was a whole nother thing, was uh, the anxiety that I felt from all of these responsibilities that I was ignoring was just absolutely overwhelming. And when I was drinking, my medication, my anxiety medication wasn't working. They say that on the bottle, that your doctor tells you that, but you don't really think it's true. When you're an alcoholic, you're like, you're hoping, at least I was hoping there was some sort of magic cocktail of pills and alcohol that I could take that would remove my anxiety yet make life still manageable. And, and it just, there wasn't, there was not a cocktail that I could figure out. And then my weight was, I was very underweight. Um, and it wasn't, it's not like I stopped drinking and all these things were fixed. Um, especially my financial security that took years for me to get that security back. I don't actually, you know, I drank my whole, the first 42 years of my life. So I don't know that I ever had financial security until I got sober. And today I do, um, because I care. And when I was dealing with all of this, uh, even after I got sober, I was so full of fear about what was going to happen, you know, financially, to my relationships, to my health. I was so full of fear about the past and what what's going to happen in the future, um, regretting the past that I was just standing still and completely non observant of my surroundings in the present moment. I was incapable of being in the present moment. I was over freaking whelmed with fear and regret. And I mentioned that I also managed to future trip with aspirations. I had this, when I was working... Uh, prior to my current job, but I also did it in my current job, I had this aspiration that I was going to come into this company, uh, the previous company, I was going to come into that company. And I was going to I was in marketing. So I was going to make decisions and implement things that were just going to, you know, make the sales of of the our products just skyrocket, you know, that I was going to come in and change their, change the world as we know it. And I can't say that, like when I first 
entered the job that I have now, I was still an active alcoholic. I was still drinking. And I had those aspirations still when I got to the current company. I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking, you know, I'm the master at this. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to make big, big impacts here. And um, and they're going to love me. You know, I'm going to be number one. It's amazing how when I was drinking, I wanted to be number one um, until I got sober and I realized that I don't want to be number one. Number one is a scary place to be. I actually prefer to be uh, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, you know, it's like it's like my son when he was younger, um, really young, elementary school, he wanted to be president of the United States. And he was so sure about it that he learned everything there was to know about all the presidents, their wives, where they were born, how long they were president, what years they were president. It was fascinating, honestly. <laughs> it was impressive. And then uh, Sept September 11th happened, and he realized that being number one is not where he wanted to be. Um, and some people still want to be in that position, and there need to be people like that. There need to be people that aren't afraid to be number one, um, but... You know, in sobriety, I don't want to be number one, but I want to be the best me that I can be. I want to do the best where I am. And over time, as I continue to grow, where I am and my aspirations do evolve and I continue to grow and want to seek more and be better, um, but I don't necessarily reach for, you know, I don't want to be president of the company. I want to be the best at my expertise. Um, so that's just my, um, my outlook on things now in sobriety. Um, that's where I'm comfortable and that's where I feel that I grow the fastest. Um, so seeking joy in this moment and, and having serenity right now. I've talked about that for the past two days. So I wanted to talk today about how do we get present? How are we fully engaged in the environment that we're standing in, in the same, in that moment. It's the same as being mindful. And I've done an episode about mindfulness. I've referenced it a lot, but it's about focusing your awareness and building a better relationship with yourself. Being, a uh, your your focused awareness is on what are you doing and how is it making you feel? And I talked about recently full-time recovery, embracing full-time recovery and how people have told me over the past two years to focus on myself. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm, I'm making sure that my career moves forward and I am focusing, you know, I'm taking care of myself. I'm fine. And it reminds me today of, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to take a sip of my coffee. I have a little something in my throat. Okay. Sorry. There's a first for that one. Okay. So, um, it reminds me of multitasking. 
that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to focus on my career and focus on myself. I've talked about how um, multitasking isn't possible. And I'll get a little more into that. But I had a friend of mine who tells me all the time, whatever you try to do, whatever you end up focusing on, you're, you're always good at it. And it made me laugh, but today it makes me think about, <clears throat> think about this multitasking idea. And being present is focusing on only one thing, what you're doing and how it makes you feel. And what I know from multitasking I see it at work and I see it in myself at home when I try to do multiple things at once. Um, if I try to do two things at once, I'm doing them half-assed, you know? Um, but whatever I give my undivided attention to flourishes, no matter what it is, you know? Um Focusing on multiple things is a contradiction because the word focus <laughs> is putting all of your concentration into something. So how can you put all of your concentration into something and then split that in half? That is not uh, the word focus as it is defined. I did not look up what it's defined, but I'm telling you what I think it's defined as. So for me, focusing on more than one thing is is defined as half-assing. <laughs> That's what I call it. So how do we focus on one thing? I need to focus on my stroke recovery, and I can only do that by prioritizing it, putting it first, and um, and not splitting my attention between that and work. And I have had an issue with that over the past, uh, well, two years, right? Uh, I can't do both. Um, not if I'm going to flourish. Not if I am going to actually get better. And I need to make a conscious effort not to insert myself at work right now. Because I could, I totally could insert myself. And I have to say, Rachel, you are not in control. I said this yesterday. You're not in control of everything. You're only... Uh, in control of yourself. And even that's questionable. But I need to focus on myself and not as soon as I try to focus on something at work, I am not able to focus on myself anymore. I'll probably start feeling a little stressful. I'll probably skip lunch. You know, I'll probably log on to the computer um, I also tend to, when I talk on the phone, unless I um, have, you know, uh, focused awareness on closing my eyes, if I talk on the phone, I end up looking all around the room. And uh, I do it a little bit with the podcast, but I've learned to just stare at one spot on the wall. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Um, and And I wrote a list here of how... Uh, how are ways that we can um, get present? So here we go. Number one, acknowledge what you're doing and the feeling that it's giving you. So I already mentioned that. Um, this goes back to that same thing that I have been saying, which is give your feeling a name. I really feel like I... Am better able to um, know myself 
if I acknowledge my feelings and give it a name, like I'm doing this, I'm sewing and it makes me feel calm or I'm playing with my dogs and it makes me feel happy. I'm baking and it makes me feel accomplished because if I don't really take a minute to acknowledge what the feeling is that it's giving me, then later, you know, another day when I'm feeling frustrated and I need to do something that lifts my spirits, I, I won't, I won't as easily remember what things make me feel good. And when I'm feeling upset, I need to be able to make that shift easily into something that makes me happy. So the more that I acknowledge things that make me happy and even say it out loud if I need to, then I'm going to recall it easier and I'm going to be able to make a mental shift to do something that makes me happy even if I don't want to. You know, there are times when I'm feeling poopy. I don't want to do something that makes me happy. It's just like when I was trying to get sober uh, before I actually did, the people in my sobriety program told me, if you want to pick up a drink, call somebody instead. Why would I call somebody? Why would I do something that's going to keep me away from what I want to do, what I want to feel, because depression feeds on itself. And if I take my wanter out of the equation, I call it my wanter, and I just do the next right thing, the, the joy follows, the, the smiles follow. I heard once, and I really think it's true, that when you're not feeling happy, put a smile on your face and the smile on the inside will grow. So if you put the smile on your face, the smile on the inside will grow as a result. Um, I think it's true and it feels awkward and it's something I don't want to do. But if I do it anyway, um, it happens. It just happens. Number two, how to get present. You know how you can be doing something and you lose yourself in it? Um, that's being present, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Um, it's like when, I, when I'm sewing, I'm just sitting there sewing. You know, if I'm listening to a book and I'm lost in the book and I'm just thinking about the book, I am present in that single thing that I'm doing. My boyfriend told me about a month ago, try to not listen to your book while you're doing something else. If you're going to listen to your book, listen to your book. If you're going to sew, sew. If you're going to take a walk, walk. Um, and that's very much the same thing as being mindful. When you're taking a shower, just take a shower. Don't listen to a book while you're in the shower um, because that's you're not being present in the moment and, and acknowledging what you're doing and how it's making you feel. Because you're, re you're listening to the book. You know what I mean? Number three, stop creating the end of your story. And that's what I was talking about yesterday with worrying. Stay in the current chapter of the story of your life. Um, if you find yourself starting to complete the story because that's what we do as human beings, say out loud, I mentioned this yesterday, I am worrying about X. I will not complete the, this story. I will just experience it. 
Number four, have a schedule. I don't know how many times I've talked about my world famous schedule, but uh, hint, hint, I think that it's a great thing to have, even on the weekends, even when you don't have anything to do. Schedule it. Schedule rest and relaxation. Look at it and see from two o'clock to four o'clock, I'm going to rest and relax because it makes you feel, it makes me feel like I'm doing something. Even though I'm not doing anything, I'm doing something for myself. Number five, trust in the process. And this goes back to not not complete, trying to complete the story and staying in the current chapter of your life that you're in. Trust that you have the intelligence to, and, and the bravery to handle whatever life is going to put in front of you. Number six, Turn off your notifications and establish a no phone zone. When I come into this room that I'm in, which used to be my meditation slash yoga room, and it's now more of like my hobby room and my, it was my office, but now I've kind of turned it into my hobby room. When I come in here, I don't... Um, I don't look, I don't text anybody in this room. Um, typically if I'm texting somebody, I'm not in this room. I didn't do that on purpose. It just happened that way. So it seems like this room, I don't want life to join me in this room. This room is my safe place. It's where I feel joy It's where I feel serenity and I don't want anybody else in here, you know, whether they're reaching me on a digital device or, um, I mean, I've invited people to come here and look at the result of my hobbies, but, um, and I would love to have people join me working on my hobbies. I'm sure my daughter's going to do that with me this weekend. She's coming home today, by the way. Um, but I really feel that this is just a, uh, an area that is just for me. So, um, it's helpful to, to have a no phone zone and it's helpful to turn off notifications. This is something that I started doing at the beginning of this, uh, phase of my stroke recovery. So it's been about two and a half months that I don't have my phone on me all the time. I don't have my notifications on all the time. Um, And it allows me to um, take uh, designated times to check my digital device. Now, I was doing it to save my head, but um, now that I've learned voiceover, I can do it without looking. So now it's not even to save my head. Now it's to uh, remain calm. Uh, Because whenever I start texting, I start getting out of the present moment. I'm, I'm completely not paying attention to what I'm doing. And, um, And so no phone zones and no uh, notifications at times is really helpful. Um, And then number seven, at the end of your day, go back, look back and acknowledge what you did throughout the day and how it made you feel. So go back to number one and, and remember, you know, remember what you did and how it made you feel. It's really a matter of getting, again, getting familiar with yourself, getting to know yourself better, um, getting to know what things make you feel certain ways so that when you want to feel that way, you can more easily pick that up. And some people call it gratefuls. 
I've done that for years. Before I go to bed, I list three things that I'm grateful for. I used to text it to um, some some friends, <laughs> um, but uh, just because of my head, I don't really text it anymore. But I do go through the mental process of of reviewing what I did that day, um, how it made me feel. And then I also just happen to think about how I made other people feel. And do I owe any anybody an amends? And that's part of my sobriety program. Other people do it in the form of prayer. And that's good too. Um, so I actually have a couple things that I do before bed. It's like a process. Um, I, uh, I did my gratefuls and then I have this paragraph that I read, which I've talked about before. And it, um, it walks me through, um, did I, did I, was I fearful of any, but anything today? Was I anxious about anything today? Do I owe anybody an amends? Was I helpful? Um, that kind of stuff. And and that really, I don't know, it just like puts the cherry on top of my day. It just makes me be able to let go of my day. As I've said before, put it on my nightstand and so that when I'm going to sleep at night, that's what I'm doing. Again, I'm present in what I'm doing when I lay my pillow on my head on my pillow. That's all I'm doing. I'm laying my head on my pillow and I'm thinking about how freaking cozy I am. <laughs> and, um, and it works. It really works for me. Um, so that's what I've got on how to be present. Uh, hopefully you find it helpful and thanks for listening today. I am going to get my ambulatory EEG. So um, I think that means I'm going to have electrodes hooked to my head for the next 24 hours. We'll see. I'll certainly post or talk about it in tomorrow's episode if I have electrodes uh, hooked to my head. So looking forward to that. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you tomorrow.